turn them off because we are recording this. And I hate cell phones to ring during a recording. <laughs> It'll kick off in a minute, I think. I got it. Okay. It may not. It may not explode out there. Try that. Is that better? Is everybody okay temperature wise? You want me to cut it up where it'll kick off? Kick it off. Kick it off. Janice, can you just bump it up? It should go off if you. It'll go off in a minute. It'll give it a minute. I want to welcome all of you here tonight. I see uh, a few new faces, so I'm glad to see some new faces. Uh, we do these uh, four or five times a year, plus we do our big gala in September. I know uh, most of you were at that. And uh, I'm sure, I don't know if you've seen the reports of what we did that night, but I'll just kind of do a recap. We did almost $30,000 uh, that night. And I was thinking that maybe we were low from last year, but then I was reminded that we also raised money throughout the year to buy the building next door. So really, if you put that into account on how much money we raised to buy the building, which was 135000 plus that 30000 we did pretty good last year for raising money uh, as far as for our building purchase. <coughs> um, we did finish up the sale of the building uh, last week. I uh, got the utilities changed over last week, so real happy about that. Now we start over again raising money to redo the building. <laughs> so uh, don't start running from me yet. Uh, you'll, you'll be seeing me. Uh, but we're, we're going to come up maybe with some new ideas on some different fundraisers. Uh, we know right off the bat we've got to have a roof. Uh, we put a roof on this one. We've already had uh, our roofer that did this roof come and give us a quote, so we know what we're looking at as far as that goes. Uh, of course, the, the whole inside of the building will have to be torn out. Too. So it's it's a long process, but at least we have that building as ours now. So we do we're not landlocked like we were. Uh, so it's that's a good thing, I think. I don't know about that. You may not think so, but <laughs> anyway, it's a good thing. The board was uh, happy with it, and uh, that's the main thing. Um, uh, this, like I said, this is our last night uh, event for 2013, and we'll start back up in February in Coral Loop. Of course, has uh, already got some plans for our 2014 speakers, uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I pretty much told y'all everything I guess I need to tell you. I am going to introduce our, uh, the man that's going to introduce the man that's going to be speaking, uh, Carlton Prothro, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Carlton's got going on. He's going to be walking for St. Jude. When's that, Carlton? In November, November 23rd. In November. He's got an online donation thing that you can go to. If you do Facebook, it's on there. It's on my page. Uh, but you can also get with Carlton, and he can explain to you how you can donate. But uh, I kind of set his goal a little lofty, uh, $10,000, $10,000. I figured Mendon could uh, support Carlton in this walk. Uh, so far, he's got $2,700. So he's doing pretty good on that. Uh, but anyway, Carlton's going to introduce our speaker, and uh, he may kind of give you a little recap. What what I want to say something before he gets up there. <laughs> uh, I want y'all to know about my neighbor, Mike Harper. He went to the veterans thing in Washington, and I'm really proud of him. And if y'all see him, be sure and tell him we're proud of him too. <laughs> And a lot of people don't, a lot of, you know, I worked for Mike for, for many, many years and, and kind of posted, I found a video of him walking. I could not pick Mike out on the video, but I know he was probably at least carrying one of those barriers if, if he had anything to do with it. Uh, but uh, a lot of people, in fact, Mike's family didn't even know this. Uh, every morning before Harper Motors would open, 
Mike Harper would be in there on the computer. And one morning I was walking by and he asked me to come in there. So I walked in and he said, I just want to show you what I do every morning. And he gets on the Vietnam virtual wall and he finds the men that he served with that were killed in action. And he leaves messages for those family members every day. He does that. So just a little known fact about Mike Harper. He's not even here. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Shelly, for introducing uh, me. I'd also like to tell you that I, I had a prior engagement. Mike Harper called me on Friday and said, would you go to Washington with me? And I couldn't go. I, would, I want you to know if I hadn't had those two prior engagements, I would have gone with Mike, and I, I wish I could have. Now, Shelley told you about the wall. My granddaughter works for St. Jude in Atlanta, and she's heading up this walkathon. And I went two years ago to Pittsburgh, and I had, I raised the most money of any <coughs> individual. My daughter-in-law was just absolutely beside herself. She told me they were going to beat me. It's my son, my daughter-in-law, my grandson, his wife, my granddaughter, and her husband, that team of six, and she said, we're gonna crush you this year. And I said, Becky, you don't have men. <laughs> and, and that is absolutely true. There is no way that she can beat me because Menden gives so much to St. Jude. And so if you do contribute, you can send me a check to St. Jude and I'll take it with me and put it in the thing. Or you can go on Facebook and Lois's Facebook and then it comes down and there's a white shoe and you punch that and um, <clears throat> it, I come up and there's a green rectangle, punch that and it gives off and then you can contribute through that way. Or call me and I can help you. Yeah. <laughs> she's a lot better than I am on that. Now, uh, Shelly asked me to introduce the man who's been introduced to you the first time he spoke. So I'm not going into any long introductions. I want to remind you that today is Columbus Day, and we are extremely fortunate to have one of his crew members to come <laughs> talk to us today. And with uh, nothing else, Frank Griffith, you are on. <laughs> <laughs> well, just walking up here, I'm a little seasick. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. When this thing started two or three years ago, and I was on the first time, I stayed up and I thought about it, and I worked at it, and I made a pretty good presentation. Then they had me all together last year. I talked about something I knew about, Back Street. And now they got me talking about Front Street. And I said, I don't know anything about Front Street. I've raised on Back Street. <laughs> so I don't know how interesting this is going to be today, but I have thought about it. And, uh, I thought about uh, a lot of things that I maybe can't tell, but that's all right. <coughs> the, uh, uh, I, I don't know how to start, <coughs> but I thought I'd start on the end of Broadway up here past the Methodist Church. When I was a little kid, and I don't know why I say a little kid growing up, uh, there was a house there, an English style house. It belonged to Madame Creighton. Madame Creighton was the mother of John Creighton, Tom Creighton, old Tom Creighton, not the boys. Uh, she was, uh, I guess she was English or Scottish, uh, Scots, I don't know. But anyway, she had, when they built her house, she didn't like the sidewalk, so she had the sidewalk in front of her house redone, and it was wide. It had a little design in it. It was a nice sidewalk, and you do it when you got to it, and there wasn't any lines that you could sort of jump through and catch and that kind of stuff. But, <clears throat> and she had a perfect yard. That first street didn't cut through there then, that's what it does now. And behind her house, <coughs> all down on MacDonald Street, she raised sheep. 
<clears throat> just the fact that there was a lady from somewhere, she might have been from Dolene, I don't know, I didn't know at the time, but she was a foreigner as far as we were concerned. They <laughs> called her Madam Creighton. That gave her a foreign name to us kids. And uh, she raised sheep, and she lived in that house, and you never saw her. Of course, I was not where it run in her circle either. I shouldn't have seen her. But she called me in one day as I was going by her house and made me tell her who I was. She said, oh, I know your daddy. Come in here. She sat on a little side straight porch, a high neck shirt uh, dress on, <clears throat> long to the floor. She was sitting in a rocket chair. And she, was, she wanted me to talk to her. I scared to death. I mean, I wanted to get out of there. <clears throat> but I'm sorry that I didn't have the presence of mind to spend a little more time with her because she could have been a very interesting person. But that's my only contact with her. But she had a beautiful old home there that they tore down when uh, she died. And uh, then ultimately the Methodist Church has that property now that's there. <clears throat> so I'm going to start right there and move south I mean, towards the depot. You understand that direction anyway. Uh, the next building was down there was the Methodist Parsonage. It was a two-story square red brick building uh, with not much uh, architectural design to it, but it was there. And uh, then, uh, the next building was the Old Methodist Church. I'll say the Old Methodist Church, the one prior to the one we have now. <coughs> prior, to the one, prior to the Old Methodist Church was the Old Old Methodist Church. The Old Old Methodist Church, uh, my daddy was the uh, secretary of the church. And uh, so the church got ready to build the, the, the old church, one that they tore down and built this new one. They wanted to put a window in the front. And nobody <coughs> would go with my daddy to St. Louis to buy the window. And he had the funds from the church, and they were going to pay for it. But he, had, he couldn't get anybody to go with him. He went to St. Louis and chose that window that's in the church today and had it shipped here, and they put it in the old Methodist church. Now, when they tore that church down, there were a lot of people in there, that's a lot here, I wasn't even here, that said, that's not the same window. And they really complained about it and carried on, but it is the same window, believe me. Uh, and I know that for a fact. They did put some braces in it because it was old. <clears throat> they didn't want it to crack and fall down. But the, it is actually the same window. But uh, the, that... And then I moved out just a little bit more, and the church needed more Sunday school classrooms. So in order to do that, they needed a building for the Sunday school classes. The church just wasn't big enough. <clears throat> so they went to Sam Webb, who we know is the Hutton House up here that's for sale on Broadway right now. Or the, uh, well, we know it, I know it as the Hutton House. I don't know what y'all call it. But you know, you know where I'm talking about, I hope. Uh, my daddy and others went up there, and this is his story. They went up to Sam Webb and said, Sam, you're old. <laughs> and he said, you're going to die. You need a legacy. And we want you to put up some money for us to build a church down here, build it for the church down here, and we'll name it Webb Hall. He said, all right. He just wrote him a check. I don't know how much. He told me, but it was a big money at the time. It could have been 10000 It could have been 100000 I don't know. But they built just a nondescript square Rectangular, not rect square, rectangular building with a beautiful hallway and a beautiful floor. If all over remember the old Webb Hall. And they just had Sunday school classes on each side of it. And they did Webb Hall. <clears throat> that was where now that tree is beside the Methodist Church. That was right there. Now they tore that now when they built the present Methodist Church. Uh, across the street was an old water tank. From there, and it was one of those uh, old spindly legs, and it had the round thing like it used to have, a, a, sort of a canopy on top of it, and it would run over about that twice or three times a year. Somebody died at the water plant would forget to measure the water or cut it off, and it would run over and flood everything up there. But uh, us kids all wanted to climb it. Of course, that was very all kind of slides, and it did everything to keep us off of it. Nevertheless, we got on it. But uh, none of us had the courage to go all the way up it. We'd go up it so far and get scared and come back down. <clears throat> but uh, I have misquoted, misstated myself several times to people just to, for the purpose of it, to say that I climbed to the top of it, but it's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, we'll, we'll continue on that side of, of the church side of Broadway now. We'll cross McDonald Street. 
<clears throat> right there on the corner, which is the parking lot for the hospital now, was the uh, 707 filling station. Now, I can't tell you who owned the 707 filling station. I was too young, and I just don't remember who owned it, but it was an old filling station. Been there a long time. And uh, it had a big cover over it, like they used to build filling stations. You could park four or five cars under the shed, gas up it when it was raining, or et cetera. And people would sit around on beaches. The beaches in those days was put out by a wrecking yard in Shreveport called D. Jitters. Mm -hmm. And the beaches says, D. Jitters, we wreck them. And they would put these beaches out, wood beaches, all out at garages and filling stations and grocery stores all over the country. And there was always two or three old men sitting around on the D. Jitters beach and they're telling stories. Elva Jeter told me, Mr. Elva Jeter, Sonny Jeter's daddy, that was his first garage when he and his brother Johnny came to Bentley from Shreveport. They had a garage at the very end of it. And uh, that's where they offered, I mean, that's where their business was. They later moved out on, on Highway 80 by, behind the Edsel Philly Station. <clears throat> but they had a, a rack out back to change the oil. And there were two racks that you just drove the car up on, and you got over there and took the oil pan out, and the oil just came out of the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, he'd been done that for about seven, eight years in there, and he had just built a pile of that like this. It was the worst thing under there you ever saw. I don't, the environmentalists would go crazy today if they saw it, but that's the way you did it in those days. Uh, I remember one time there was a uh, local attorney and his wife and others that had come back from Shreveport after being entertained uh, for a while. And they were going down through Homer Road through that bow down there past Walmart. And it was flooded. And they ran the car into the water and it flooded. They didn't drown, they got out. But I went in that next morning, which was a Sunday morning, and the car was still there <laughs> leaking water out of every direction. They were trying to clean it out in there. Uh, these are just memories that I have now. You got to understand, I didn't research any of this. I can't give you dates and I can't authenticate anything I'm saying. It's what I remember that I saw or what I was told and took for granted as being true. But it's my memories of Main Street. Uh, right across from the, SO, from the 707 filling station, we talked about this the last time I was here, the very corner down by the water tank was Jack Fuller's garage. He had a front entrance that nobody ever used. They used the side entrance or the back entrance. Next door to that was a little small building that uh, I don't know who was in it at that time, but somewhere along in there, well, the knock on better wrong. The next building out was Willard and Roberts, uh, uh, Willard, Ro Brown and Roberts Lumber Yard. And it went all the way through from Front Street to Back Street. But their office was on Front Street. Mm -hmm. And then next door to the Lumber Yard was a little building that some union out there, and I don't know whether it was a union for the railroad or what union it was, but it was a union office that had one employee in there, and that was it. And it was there for a number of years, I don't remember. Uh, Thad might remember, because he was right next door with Thad and his motor company, mm -hmm. right next door to it. And we talked about Andrew's motor company the last time I was here also. But uh, we'll shift, I'll stay with that side of the street now. We're on the, the far side of the street from the church. Uh, the uh, next thing up was the used car lot. Uh, the next thing, next door, door to that at that particular time was uh, uh, Mims filling station, a Gulf filling station. Owned by Frank Treat, run by uh, Mr. Mims, I don't know which Mr. Mims. A Mims filling station though. And again, it had this big shed over it that you could drive under. And Frank Treat office in there. He had a little office over to the right hand side of it. Uh, and uh, that's where he did all his business. And his secretary was uh, uh, one of his daughters, uh, Puck, as we knew her, uh, Margaret. And uh, she worked in there for him. And that's where he would get up in about mid morning and take his pipe and gradually walk down Main Street and visit with everybody on his way to the post office. And he always had a story to tell about something. His pipe was crooked and he would hold it and smoke on it. And they, he was. Uh, very interesting man. He was a very nice person. And, uh, but uh, they did a lot of business there. I'm going to shift now back over to the other side. Next to the 707 filling station was a used car lot. Well, it wasn't a vacant lot. It was later a used car lot. Uh, but the next to that was the old Rex Theater building. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had a flower shop and a ladies boutique of some nature 
ladies boutique on the right hand side facing the building, the flower shop on the left hand side. And it was the best theater in town. It had the latest equipment and it was, uh, it was a good theater. They had a professional machine operator that operated it and uh, he kept it filled on the screen, which wasn't an easy thing to do in those days. And, uh, Pat, uh, oh, Pat had, uh, Edgar had and his wife Pat owned it. And uh, Edgar was quite a character. He was a nightman. He would be sitting around now past what's now the courthouse, because that was a park, uh, 11 o'clock at night or something, and waiting for a bunch of kids to come around. They'd all get in the truck and they'd go put out signs down in different places, Dorlene and Sibley and all, for what the picture show was going to be next week. So he would put those signs out there tonight, and he, he was quite a character. He ended up on the drive in theater out on the Shreveport Road, if you all remember that. I don't know whether you do or not, but it was there. And it was, a, it was quite a place, too. Uh, but uh, I'll let that stop right there. <laughs> uh, the, uh, <clears throat> we'll stay on that side of the street and just uh, cross the little alleyway there, that, right at the hospital that goes at an angle. Uh, we cross over that little triangle of apartments there. That was just a tree out there in dirt and it belonged to Fort's newsstand. John Ford had a newsstand right there. And that's where all the papers came to town. And George Ford was a great big, tall, slender young man that ended up being a lawyer. And they had a dog named Joe. And Joe was a, I probably was a Rottweiler. I don't know what he was, but he was a mean dog if you, if you tried to get in that truck. If he was out on the street or in that building, it wasn't mean. He'd just go up petty, but he wouldn't let you in that truck. And George rode in a, in a rocking chair in the back of the truck, and somebody drove it, and he threw out the bit of the paper where it was going all over town, and the dog rode with it. But the dog wouldn't let you get near that truck. I mean, if you went up there to say something to George Ford or to the dog, he would, go away, go away. And the dog would, Argh. I mean, he wasn't going to let you hit it. Uh, so uh, that was quite a scene to see old George back there. He looked like, I don't know what, he just real tall and lanky. And he was being in that rocking chair throwing that newspaper, and he was just in hog heaven, but he loved it. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> the, uh, the next door to that, uh, actually, uh, well, that was, the, the, that was the, the, the newspaper office, but the newspaper office also had an ice cream uh, bar in the back of it. And they had this little guy that worked back there that was Alabama. He was, uh, he was just an Alabama individual. He had a lot of white, white. A lot of black, hot, white. White. black and white. They called him Whitey. They called him Whitey. Do what? They called him Whitey. Whitey, all right. And, uh, see, now I got some help. I need help. I had forgotten that. <laughs> I thought we called him Shorty. <laughs> but anyway, next door to really, to. Well, I told you earlier, last time, I think I told you, but. John uh, Ford got in trouble, uh, and I'm going to hold off on this story until a little later in the day, and I'll come back to him. Uh, right next to that was uh, uh, Dan Pace's barbershop. Now, that's old Dan Pace, not young Dan Pace that's now dead. They've had a barbershop in there, and Shorty Tyson was one of his barbers that took the first chair. And he had two sons that lived here, Bob Tyson and his brother, some of them today. I don't remember his name. But they were kid, good kids, and Shorty was a great fisherman. And they did a lot of business. Benton at that time had five barber chairs, barber shops, and about eight barber chairs. Now we got two barber shops and four barber chairs. People don't get their hair cut anymore, I guess. Or it all falls out and they don't need it. Uh, but uh, they did a lot of talking and a lot of barber shop work up there. Uh, right next door to that, was a millinery shop, and I may pronounce this right, a millinery, millinery shop. Two ladies, or several ladies, I don't know who owned it. And I really don't know what it, it might have been Miss Shelfer, but I'm not sure. They made hats and veils, they did tanning work, and all this real fine crocheting and so forth, and they did anything you wanted. These little things that women used to wear around the neck up in here, they wear hats and they had veils on them. All this place, they made them handmade right there. They did a good job, and I don't know who owned it, and I, but I just don't know who owned it. I think it might have been Miss Shelfer, but I don't know. But she had other ladies that worked for her. <clears throat> Next door to that, I've got 
draw a blank. <laughs> I, I will get to the other side of the service street. Service grocery. <laughs> huh? Service grocery. No, we're too far down service grocery. It was, huh? it moved out to that because they had well, a well, we, well, I want to get the hardware store in there before the service grocery. <laughs> but the hardware store might have been next door. The hardware yeah. store burned at 33. But I was six years old when it burned, but they built it. Main Street was a mud hole. It wasn't it paved or anything. So that every store had built up a little front in it so that the water and the mud and all could get into the stores. And they had a little ledge out there that had a metal top on it. And I would go downtown with my daddy. That's where I would sit on that ledge in front of that big hardware store. And it burned in 1933. All right, and that became an open wall down there. To, but uh, in, in there, that big period of time, it never was built anything built in there for many years. But uh, service grocery was built in there later on and served. I, I'm getting a little confused because the hardware store was below service grocery. That's where that's where the Donald House was later on. H. L. Bridges had a little cafe in there. Tall cafe. The tall no, uh, it was the Donald House. Donald House. Donald House. Mm -hmm. North End H. L. And I, I think the tunnel was probably built into that space. The tall cafe that, that, that burned. The tall cafe was in the in the in the hotel down there that the Lux Resort. It's still there. Had the upstairs apartment in it now. Yeah, and I think that was built in that gap. Well, it was built on the lower end of the gap. Right, right. Yeah, but the gap was between there and coming back this way. Right. And it stayed vacant for a long, long time. A parking lot and everything in there. Uh, but I'm gonna cross the street now. I may, I may be getting you confused on this. I get myself confused. Uh, <laughs> So the corner up there was uh, Tesley Carmel and uh, Grady Gray had the Gray Carmel Insurance Agency. Right on the corner of uh, the top line up there across from Mims and Philly Station. Later bought out by Jim Breitch. Uh, and, but uh, then next door to that was Harry Heckler. Harry Heckler had a bid store in there. But Harry Heckler was quite a character in himself and his son, Little Harry, was a character. <coughs> and, uh, he was a trader. He would uh, he would trade anything that he had. He'd come to town with, with a pocket knife or a chicken or a bucket, and he before the hole he had something a lot better. He would he'd trade with anybody that he saw. He would trade up, but he was quite a character, and he, he did a lot of that. I remember David uh, uh, who old city drugstore Williams. David Williams. David Williams spoke at his funeral. Mm -hmm. And said, yeah, I saw him one day come to town with a pocket knife and go home with ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Harry Hegler had that, and then uh, the old store there, there. It, it, I guess right next door to that became uh, West Brothers. Uh, mm -hmm. West Brothers was a big department store, mm -hmm. opened on the front and back street, and it's owned by H. O. West and Claude West's daddy. A nice department store. The next door was uh, Morgan and Lizzie. <clears throat> That's what we call a 10 cent store today, or we call it then. Morgan and Lizzie had a lot of stuff in it, sold for a dime and so forth. But they had a lot of, if you wanted something, it's like going to Walmart. You could probably find it at Morgan and Lizzie. It wouldn't cost a dollar, but you could find it there. And it was a big store. Next door was uh, the Western Auto. Mr. A.J. Price and his wife uh, ran that, and uh, it's still the Western Auto. Right there, but it's enlarged since then. Uh, right next door to that was, uh, first of all, it was uh, Jack Bridges' uh, clothing store. He had a clothing store there, and uh, uh, Albert Smokey worked for him. And Jack Bridges had Dick Garrison, the Texas tax assessor at that time. And uh, Albert Smokey would stand in the front door waiting on a customer, and all they would talk about would be football and baseball connected with Method. And they were the experts on everything connected with it at all times. They knew all about it. <clears throat> Next door to that was uh, the barber shop, and it was uh, uh, Justin Norman was the barber. Johnson. Part of Norman's, huh? Johnson. Huh? Johnson Barber Shop. No, Justin Norman's Barber Shop next door to there. Johnson was across the street later on. Johnson was on, on Highway 80 when I was a little bitty kid across from Jesus Garage. He came later and built that. He might have been in there a short while. You know, you might be right, but it ended up being. Uh, yeah. Had a crooked neck. 
<laughs> well, you, you might be right for a short while it was in there. It was a barber shop, but uh, uh, Norman had it till he died. And it was on the other coast of that alley. And the uh, next thing down there, the old Knights of Pythias building, as we remember it, was actually, uh, it, it's already halfway in the back of it was a laundry on that alley. And the front of it was uh, uh, Bubba Bars or Birch Bars, as we know it, is their real name. It's Bubba, we call it, jewelry store. Mm -hmm. And the old jewelry store, and he worked on clocks and watches and sold jewelry. And next door to that was Miss, uh, Miss Creighton's Creighton. Millinery Della. Shop. Huh? It's, it's Miss Della Creighton. Della Creighton. No, it was Miss Della Creighton's shop yeah. down there. But that's not the one I'm talking about on the other side. Yeah. Where's what I'm talking about, I think, belonged to Miss Shelford. Della Creighton's on the one down on the left. Right. Yeah. Uh, and she had ladies that worked in there by it. Eliza Todd, my great aunt, uh, could do all this kind of work. And she worked at both shops, but she worked mostly down at Miss Della Creighton's shop. Uh, Miss Della Creighton was a sister to Dick Garrison's wife, and Dick Garrison's wife was a sister to Bill. Uh, uh, and I tell you what, I'm sitting so old, I can't do this. <laughs> You're doing good. Uh, uh, Gleason. Huh? Bill Gleason. Bill Gleason's wife, who owned hold the bike. Bill Gleason's wife and Miss Della Creighton were sisters and also Miss Garrison. But Miss Della would go down to visit, uh, remember this, I'm digressing a little bit, she'd go down to visit her sister on the end of the street where I live, on Elm, and about dark, a little after dark, she would right walk in the street because it, she didn't want to stumble. And boy, she could slick her arms, I mean, when she walked, it was just like this. <laughs> and we talked about, there goes Della. You know, <laughs> she would hoof, hoof it back to her house. But she had this millinery shop, and I say my aunt worked in there. Uh, and she could do all this tanning work, and they just beautiful stuff. I don't think people don't do that today, and the women don't even use it. They don't wear it, or they, they, it's not what they had in those days. But they did a good business here with it. And uh, uh, I've lost track of where I am on this thing. We got down to. Uh, Headshot. Well, we passed up, we passed up something before we get to this Della Creighton's down there. I can't remember what. We said, nice to fit this building, but, uh, oh, I know what it was. It had, a, it had a, a laundry halfway back into it, like I said, but in the front of it was an office, and I have no idea who was in that office up front. It later became an accounting office for Clary's Ware, but it, 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 Miss Della was in the next, next building. Martin Greer, wasn't it, before? Well, yeah, that was, that was you were 10, 15 years beyond what I'm trying to talk about. You're right. Martin Greer was in there at one time. Even had Luther in there one time. Had who? Luther Moore. Well, I didn't know that. Where is Luther? He couldn't verify that. There was a bakery there at one time. That, well, that was, too, a bakery there, Luther. Yeah, you're correct. See, I need, I need help. I forgot about the bakery being there. Uh, and, uh, so then we get down to T.T. Sumter's barber shop. It's right on the corner where that old Phillips station used to be. It's just uh, something in there now that you could cut through Bay Street to Back Street. <laughs> and T.T. Sumner owned that. And T.T. was a little bitty fellow, skinny, probably weighed 125 pounds. And uh, he had four barber chairs in there. And every Sunday morning, they had a shoeshine boy that showed up there. And all of the men from the churches, the Baptist, Methodist Church, and all come down early in the morning and get the shoes shine. It was a place to go to get your shoes shined on Sunday morning. Well, you want to have that? They'd dress up at once, and that was on Sunday, and your good shoes on. And so there was a lot of talk going on there, a lot of foolishness. And uh, Joe Acock was an off field man. He was a driller, a rough neck, a big, big bold, big person, not all that heavy and fat, but just big, and very strong. And Joe Acock, and they were fooling around with the TC, and they were just. They were just playing, they wanted any, anything to tend to harm about it. <clears throat> but the barber shop had a glass window out on the main street, and it had a glass window into that little Philly station area over there, that became Bill Guthrie's uh, bus station at a later date. Mm -hmm. And somehow, Joe Acock picked up TC and threw him against that glass wall and broke it. And everybody says he threw him out, threw him out through the window into the parking lot. Well, he didn't, he just threw him against the wall. It was an old plate glass window that broke, but nobody got cut. But it was the talk of the town for a long time, and of course it got exaggerated about this. They were in a fight and all. They wanted any fight. It was just playing around in there. 
and he slipped and fell against it. And, uh, but they always credited Joe Acock for throwing it through that plate last winter, which is not really true. Uh, in the back of there, T.T. Sutter's wife had a ladies' beauty shop. Uh, Y'all remember that. You don't remember that still further back in that same place was the original trail, trailway bus station. Uh, I can remember that, but none of you, I don't think, will ever remember that. But it, it was there at one time. That's where the buses stopped. Uh, but uh, then we get to that little filling station. It was a filling station actually in there at one time, a city service station. But then it became a little of everything from then on down. Then we move into the Imperial Hotel. And I'm going to stop that side of the street and come back up and go down the other side. Uh, now we're going to leave the, the millinery shop and the old hardware store that burned at 33. And uh, we move on down the street to, as you say, service grocery. That was uh, Walter McCoy's grocery store. And uh, Walter was from Dudley, one of the McCoys, Dudley McCoys. And uh, he would deliver groceries. And everybody that lived in Dudley that had anything to do with Dudley always used Walter McCoy. And he would go across the street and buy something at TG and Wife, and then just pull a thread for something to bring it along with his groceries when they delivered it. And uh, so it was the uh, old hometown type stuff. Uh, Walter got uh, accidentally shot in a, uh, uh, quote, a hunting accident. He slipped with a, with a shotgun and got killed. It was an accident. And actually, he was with uh, Dr. Tom Alley, who was his very best friend when it happened. But it was an absolute accident. Uh, anyway, so, but now we're down to we start getting into the new part of, of Main Street around there. Uh, oh, I forgot about one thing. I passed up the... Duke Garland's. I'm not Didn't there yet. I'm not there yet. I passed up. I passed up uh, the uh, from Western Auto, right before you got to Western Auto, and before you got to Jack Bridges' clothing store, there was a doorway that went upstairs into uh, Dr. Webb, who was the dentist's office, in the back end of that building, and uh, that's where he. It, a lot of people didn't know what it was, just a doorway out there. It's still there, I think. I don't know, but uh, I didn't have a look to see. But uh, nevertheless, that's where his office was. That went to Dr. But there was a little bitty slot in there about like this. And Mr. Tom Green, old man Tom Green, we used to call it because he was old and had a big white beard. But he had a peanut machine. And he parked his peanut machine in there at night and uh, to where he, people would break into it and steal from it. And he put his peanut machine down on Pearl Street, <coughs> right next to Boyle's Drugstore. Uh, it wasn't Boyle's then, but yeah, right there, right here on Pearl Street. That's where he sold fresh roasted peanuts. And that's where his peanut machine stayed for years, right there in that little slot. Uh, the, uh, we come down the other side of the street and we get into the high tower building. And that's where uh, Luke Garland had a jewelry shop in the high tower building. Right there, and uh, Doctor. Well, I guess I don't know whether Hightower was a doctor or not, but I think he was a doctor. He was from Homa. I think he was a doctor, but he had a pharmacy in there. Anyway, he didn't have. He wasn't. He wasn't a doctor's office. He had a pharmacy in there, and Luke Garland had his uh, his uh, jewelry business in there. But then you get to where the old space was down there that they built the Donald House in, and so forth. And uh, so now we're on. The far side of the street, we're down in the Imperial Hotel, which was a fixture in this day, too. Uh, a lot of strange things happened there. We had one local man, I'm not going to call that names. This thing gets embarrassing as you go along. I don't know who's kid to who. Uh, got pretty bad at something one time and got a shotgun, and he shut the traffic down on Main Street with a shotgun, sitting up in that hotel, shooting anybody that goes down Main Street. Yeah, he shut down all day long <laughs> before they talked him out of it. <laughs> it was a that no violence ever came from it. Uh, his family is very prominent here today. <laughs> but uh, he was uh, quite a character. But uh, we come back on the other side, uh, we back to the tall cafe, as you mentioned, and, and Lunchford, Lunchford Cafe and that hotel. I don't know the name of the hotel. It was just still there. That building is still there. Okay. But I don't remember the name of the hotel. Uh, I was very young and certainly had no business been in a hotel. I, I was embarrassed to go in a cafe. I've never been in a cafe when that was built. Uh, I was scared to go in. I think I wouldn't have enough money to buy whatever I ordered. I didn't know how to order it. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, in that open space, the carnival people would set up in there with a deal where you shoot, you had a string holding a 
five-dollar bill, put up twenty cents or fifty cents, and give it to what twenty-two rifle to any kid in there. And the man sitting right there was I'll sponsor this kid and put up a dollar, and he's shooting at that twenty-dollar bill, cutting the string. Of course, the sights on those twenty-two rifles were off. Nobody ever cut the string, but they was shooting at it a lot. I did that quite often. Uh, in fact, I did cut it one time, and I cost the man more than he got out of it. <laughs> Boy, I hit it. But uh, things were set up in that burnout space, and there was a general parking lot. Then you got into the Tower Theater. Uh, Scout Theater was the original name of it. Scout. But it was Scout, but it became later the Tower Theater. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a long walk from the very front of it down to where you got into the slope of the theater. It was just a hallway in there, but the theater was uh, on Friday, on Saturday nights they had a drawing, and you could win a, a set of dishes. And I remember going to the drawing one Saturday night, and some farmer had won that set of dishes, and it probably cost three dollars. But he was waving his hand and walking down the aisle, having won that set of dishes. It was a great thing for people to do at that time. He drew his number, but they didn't have a men's restroom in the building. And a ladies' restroom, but they didn't have a men's restroom. And to go to the restroom, a kid had to come out of the theater, come into that long hallway about halfway up it, and turn and go into the city drugstore, and step down a big long step in there, right into the ladies' cosmetic department, and then go back in the back, around behind the, the, the counter where Froggy and David were, to use the restroom. <laughs> and uh, then come back out of there, go back into the theater. That's the only way you could get there. And we used to say, stand guard while I go in this ladies' room. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but uh, it was, uh, now they wouldn't let the kid come back here like that for any reason in the world. And uh, we saw all those models back there and all that medicine and everything. Our eyes got that big, you know. But uh, that was an unusual thing. John Benton worked as a soda jerk in there at that time, by the way, at the city drugstore. He was working behind the counter with uh, that. I thought Johnny was going to be here tonight, but he's not here. Yeah. Oh, is he here? Why oh, didn't see you over there? You get out. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, uh, but uh, there's a lot of things that happened there. Dr. Benton's office right upstairs there above the city, city drugstore. And uh, I draw a blank and told about a guy to me. Who was the, uh, uh, who was the boy? He lived on Assembly Road, worked at the laundry down here for many years, sort of ran it. Uh, he got an uncle named Oscar, lived out on the Homer Road, right in that big curve, big farm out there. And I can't call his name. Uh, he, uh, he was in the Navy, World War II, but Jack Chrysler just came to me out of that like yeah. that. Jack Chrysler. Jack Chrysler was bad about getting his arm broken. And he had more than once. And I came in there one day, and Jack Christmas was sitting up near the front of the city drugstore with an arm dangling. I said, Jack, what are you doing? Oh, I broke my arm. I'm waiting for Dr. Benton to show up. John was giving it uh, soda floats, so ice cream and Coke floats, <laughs> while he was waiting on the clock, you know, in there. And I said, aren't you in pain? No, oh, I said, I've had this lots of, before. This third time I broke my arm. And I thought, man, he's a tough old boy. He's a bar <laughs> boy sitting out here waiting on the doctor. I'd be home crying. <laughs> but, Jack Christmas. I've been thinking of that for three days, and it just came to me like that. I've been working on it. Uh, I didn't come out with it. Uh, he lived on the Sydney Road. His uncle is Oscar Chrysler, and they do own the big farm right after you go through the, the, I mean, the triangle flats on the Hover Road and start to curve, and off to the right, that's all with Oscar Christmas farm. Jack and I went out there, well, I'm digressing now. We went out there one Sunday to plow. We plowed from well after daylight till about noon. I say plow, we were young. Both of us trying to hang one plow, and his daddy and I, they trying to help us. Then we quit, went to the house, and we ate. We all lay on the back porch and took a nap. That was my experience of plowing. <laughs> I didn't go back to the plow. I went on home. <laughs> but uh, we did we did do that one time. And uh, but uh, when we left uh, the city drugstore. I think you went into Reese Simmons' uh, clothing store next down there. And it was just uh, had a general merchandise type store. Uh, the next thing was the Killer Grocery Store. The Killer Grocery Store was trying to fix you. Uh, I will say, old man Killer, to, digress, to distinguish between Governor Killer and, 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 and somebody else. But 
we called him Old Man Killen. It was Mr. Killen. And he wore a white shirt, long sleeve white shirt with cuffs burnt, and his pocket was full of pencils and papers and everything to write with. And he had live chickens at the back end of the store. You could come in from the parking lot out back and walk up a little five steps and go in there right by the chickens. And when you come home from school, you would go in there, and you'd go in there to Bob Kidder, who later became governor of Louisiana, and you'd tell him you want to get 10 cents and put it on Bob's bill because I want to go to the picture show. So he'd give you 10 cents out of the restaurant and put it on my mother's bill, and I'd go to the picture show. That went on for several weeks before I talked. <laughs> 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 we stopped that. But uh, Kidder's grocery was really something else. He specialized in chickens, and he had a lot of chicken pens in the back end of that grocery store. And with live chickens in there. You can get a live chicken in there then. Uh, can't do that now. In fact, the EPA would kill you with all those chickens in there with the open vegetables and everything else. But uh, it didn't hurt anybody. Nobody died from it. And the man's son was just great. He, uh, he, he, was, he was a lot of things. Uh, he, he was my scoutmaster at one time, and he was the governor of Louisiana at one time. Uh, his wife, if, if he came to my wedding, and my wife used to keep whatever they gave us as a great keepsake came from the governor, came to our wedding as a wedding present. I have no idea what it was now or if I still had it. <laughs> but she thought a lot of it and we appreciate it. Uh, but uh, uh, he was uh, um, part of Sheriff Sintel's family back there. And uh, he uh, a nice man. I liked, I liked him as a person, a little kid, but he was always nice to me and courteous. And, and he was a great big healthy boy when he worked at his daddy's grocery store down there. You know, and, uh, but uh, he, uh, he married Dr. Sintel's sister. Am I correct? Is there? They, they were first, my dad and, and Governor Kennedy were first cousins. Right? Oh, they were first cousins. Okay, well, I'm, I'm in the ball game. Yeah, and uh, the, uh, after he passed Kennedy's grocery store, uh, I thought of, I sort of lose out as to what was in there next. Nobody needs to help me because I can't come out with what was in the next building right there. No, it was her. The steps to the, to the, the doctor's what? office upstairs had stairs. Well, you had the stairway to Dr. Benton's office upstairs. But then there was a building right in there, too. But, you know, off this front street building, and I don't know who was in that. Maybe it was Ray Simmons, and I was just getting a little confused. Next to that was uh, Wallace's grocery store, I mean, furniture store. Uh, and they had a furniture store in there. And next to that was the Star Drug Store. And the Star Drug Store was on the corner of Pearl Street and, uh, mm -hmm. and Broadway. Dr. Banks had an office upstairs too, Dr. Banks, Dennis. Yeah. No, you're wrong. You're, you're, you're mistaken. I'll, I'll come back with you later. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Banks, Dr. Banks was in the Sintel building on, on the street back of the hospital. He never had an office up there above on the front street. Yes, he did. Well, you yes. you older than me, so I, I'll digress to you. <laughs> well, I didn't know it. He was my next door neighbor, and I thought I knew where he officed all my life, but uh, I don't I don't remember him office on Front Street. But that building, the Centel building, was built much later, so he, Yeah. Okay. So he, so he was been up there. Yeah, well, he might have been, because I don't remember him being up there, but yeah. anyway. Uh, now, you get further down the street on the top of the, uh, off the Star Drug, you had Dr. R. A. Smith, who was an eye, ear, and nose doctor. But that had the peach farm out here on Highway 80. And, uh, but uh, I stop at Pearl Street, and I go back to the to old side of the Imperial Hotel. I never really knew who owned the Imperial Hotel, and don't to this day, but it was a thriving thing at one time. It had a restaurant in there. It stayed open 24 hours. Uh, Frank Coffey of the Coffey family of Midland uh, uh, was the night clerk in there, read it. And lots of fights took place in there. Frank Coffey was a great big old strong man, and he normally won the fights. I mean, he, his customers were getting the fight. And his favorite thing to do, and you won't believe it today, people wouldn't do it. He'd grab somebody by the neck and run them into the corner of that marble countertop. Get <laughs> them in the car, they were over with right then. If they weren't knocked out, they were gushing blood, and the gun up went out. So anyway, he, he never had to call the police. Uh, <laughs> And there were a lot of fights that took place in there at one or two o'clock in the morning. Uh, but uh, I, believe, I believe it was F.B. Dunn. Uh -huh. F.B. Dunn run the hotel, I think. Right? Mr. F. Dunn? Yeah. Mr. Dunn Brand, lived in the Brand, hotel. Yeah. Okay. But I don't know who owned the hotel. I, mean, yeah. I think the Crate was on the building. The Crate owned the building? Okay. They did later, I know. Yeah. Well, uh, 
Allie Brackett was, uh, had, had the Pontiac place here, and Allie was uh, becoming a big man at Bendon. He was making a lot of money, and he was uh, energetic, and he was a good salesman. And Allie Brackett would get up about 4 o'clock in the morning and dress out with all of his finery on like he was going to church, his tie, his suit, and his uh, mason buckler, what he wanted to wear, and, and so forth. And he'd be down there about 4.30 at the, bar, at the restaurant at the, at the Imperial Hotel. Well, all, all the field was big up here then. All those roughnecks coming in there, eating breakfast, getting a lunch to go, something to take out with them, and all that. He bet them all. Oh, man, come by and see me, son. I'd like to do business with you. He was in there politicking every morning to sell money. Uh, and he did a good job on it, too. He sold a lot of cars. Um, but uh, then we had an alley next door to that, and that restaurant in that hotel had to vent into that alley. And it was the messiest thing. The vent was just full of grease up there that came out into the alley. Then it dripped down on the alleyway out there. It was, you just didn't want to go down that alley with that out there. And it was a bad shape. And that was also the back door to Max Pool Hall. Yep. Uh, Max Pool Hall is where the bank is now on, on Main Street down there. And I worked in there some at, at night after school, racking balls and so forth. Worked in an hour or two of 20 cents or something. But there was a basement in that building. I've been in it. You went back there to the right and you opened that door that they didn't use and you looked down there and it was horrible. It had about that much water in it. It was black and it stuck. The basements leaked in those days. They couldn't keep water out of them. And I know that basement was there. I've personally been in that basement. Everybody argues me to death that there's never a basement in that building. Somebody in remodeling that building filled that basement up because that basement was there. I can guarantee you. And uh, I talked to some young man here that had bought that building. Uh, I don't know who he was. He left out. He was a lawyer. He owned it. I said, what about the basement? He said, no basement in that building. And I convinced him it was. It bad. I had no I'd love to know it was there. I would have dug it out. I guess they filled it up with dirt and put a sleeping slab over the top of it. I don't know. It's not there now. But it was a basement. And that basement went under the next building, which was a working man's clothing store. They sold work boots and coveralls and, and uh, work clothes. And they sold cow feed out the back here on Back Street. And I don't know who owned that store, but it was there. My uncle worked for Lee Products and he sold Lee work clothes. And he always called on that store and came to see my, my mother and so forth when he was in town. So I know it was there, but this basement sort of went under that building also. I'm guessing, but I thought it did. The above part of that building was the Masonic Lodge at that time, top part of it. Uh, the next building over from there was, was the bank building. Uh, well, the bank is there now. I'm getting myself confused. The bank is where that pool hall was mm -hmm. right now. That's, that's where the, the pool hall was, where the bank is. And the next building was the feed store building and the clothing store. The next, next building down there was Tom Glass's general merchandise store. Mr. Tom Glass lived up on the... Uh, uh, Broadway, over on the right-hand side, uh, his, uh, uh, in the house that, uh, I don't know who owned that house up there, they, they made a bed and breakfast out of it, they tried to, where is it, where is uh, Claire Bowman, she'd tell me, who, who, who lived in that house? Harry McKinnis. Huh? Harry McKinnis. No, I'm not here in the wrong spot, I'm talking about next door to you. Tom Glass. Tom Glass's house. Yeah. Who, who lives there now? Harry McKinnis. No, you're on the wrong side of the street. I'm talking about old Tom Glass on your side of the street. Harry who lived next door to you? No, he lived across the street because yeah. he had a cow, and yeah. he would bring that cow over to put it in our pasture behind our house, <laughs> and that cow would just go down one of those driveways and back up the other. And one time he was going across there, and the car hit him. But it hurt the car more than it did the cat. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> I think that was Alberta Glass. Mm -hmm. Alberta Glass. I said Tom Glass. It was Alberta Glass that owned that big house over there. Yeah, next door to you. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, I don't know who owns it now. It doesn't matter. But that was Alberta Glass that lived over there. That was Tom Glass's dad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Tom Glass lived on the other side. I know where that is. Yeah. I thought his, I thought... That top glass is daddy was also top glass, but it's Alberta glass. Mm -hmm. Right. They were raised up around Coffee. They came to Bendon. Uh, the, uh, I'm sort of digressing. I know this is not very interesting to y'all, but I can't remember it all. Uh, and, uh, I need this help. Uh, but Alberta glass is 
general merchandise store was a tall building, and it had this ladder that had rollers on it and a rod up there that it slid on, and you could get on the ladder and slide it down there and climb up here and get some shoes down way up the top or get something else down from the shelves. And as a kid, I always wanted to get on and have them push me. I push me down the glass, and I'd get spiked for being on it more than once and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> but uh, it had a, he did a lot of business in there. That was, uh, that was Todd Glass's store. And uh, the, uh, he had big plate glass windows out front, and at that time, the sidewalk there was built up. I don't know whether it was wooden or what it was, but it was built up anyway, and the steps curved around the corner. The, the steps wasn't just here and over here, it was just a curved step all the way around the corner. Right there. Right after the 32 or 33 hurricane, uh, tornado, my daddy took me downtown to see what the damage was and so forth, and we're standing there, and all that glass is broken out of Todd Glass's store, and I'm standing out there barefooted. And somebody said, what are you doing that boy out here barefooted on that glass? And he grabbed me up, put me back in that bottle, and he said, you stay put in here. <laughs> but uh, I remember that specifically. Uh, but we're just about, uh, we're just about down to uh, Pearl Street now. On the other side of Todd Glass's store was the old post office. Uh, the uh, post office was built on top of a spring, according to my daddy. Uh, he says when they came there to build it, he told them there's no need of building that building there, and there's a spring under there. There was a spring under there, and they kept siphoning water out from that post office building until they tore it down. It would, it would fill up with water, they siphoned it out, and it would sink a little bit, and they had problems with it ever since it was built. But it was a spring under that building. That's where the bank is now. Uh, the, uh, the next thing past the post office was the street that went right straight downhill right into the jail. And that was the tree of knowledge, a great big oak tree out there on the corner of the courthouse. And all the old men would gather up there and uh, smoke cigarettes, chew tobacco, and tell lies. And it was called the tree of knowledge. And everybody in there was very knowledgeable about everything they talked about, whether they knew it or not. And uh, uh, there it is. Is that it right there? Okay, well, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's it, no blare. The, uh, we go back to, to the. Uh, Across Pearl Street, now you got into Web Hardware. Web Hardware was certainly a fixture in Bedford. It was the hardware store. People thought it was bought by the Web family. It, the hardware business was actually owned by Bud Row Hardware. The building was owned by the Web family. Am I correct, sir? I don't know. I think the, I think the business is owned by Bud Row Hardware, but it was called Web Hardware mm -hmm. because the Web family owned the building that it was in. And, uh, Will Life was the main manager in there for years and years and years. And uh, Will Life uh, was always one that wore a bow tie, long sleeve shirt with a cuffs button, and uh, sort of very prim. Uh, Miss Essie Scarlett was his secretary back there in the back, and a lot of people worked in there from time to time. And uh, it was quite a place. But uh, Will Life was out at the in a, in a coffee shop here in town many years later. And he asked Dave Carson, he says, Dave, he says, Dave was in there with different stuff and his old hat on that was horrible looking. He had shaved it two or three days. Dave, he says, how do you go about training a bird dog? He said, Mr. Will, I ain't sure you can. First thing you got to be is smarter than the dog. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 but uh, Will Life ran that store for many, many years. And, uh, uh, a lot of people that that worked in there from time to time. The clerk did there. Uh, we go, the next building now was Brown and Goodwill. Uh, that was uh, Clarice Brown, where is she? Daddy, and Ralph Goodwill. It was the latest store in Bedford. I mean, it had the latest merchandise, the most uh, modern merchandise. Uh, it was just the store. If you were you know, really wanted to buy anything of quality, you went to Brown and Goodwill. That's all it was to it. And uh, the old boy that chewed the backer and was a, was a pitcher and ended up on the sheriff's department, they owed his better, called him left it better, worked in there selling ladies' clothes. One man that you would have thought would never have been in there, but he worked in there for years at Brown and Goodwill. And uh, he later went in business with Ed Gully and they put in a men's store, but that, he got his trade in at Brown and Goodwill. Now, Mr. Brown was a tall, slender person, and he dressed impeccably. Uh, tall people can wear their clothes nicely, and he wore his very nicely. 
He always had on a matching coat and pants or a shirt and tie that looked good, a hat, formal in every respect, went to work early in the morning and tended everything down there. But more about noon, his day was beginning to get over with. And it took him a while to walk home sometimes after that. But he never failed to walk home all the way from down there to town. He lived down on Goose Street uh, down there. And he never failed to get home, I guarantee you. But he walked home every day. He would, I don't know how he got to work in the morning. I guess he might have walked. I never saw him going to work. But I saw him coming home from work many times. And that was his later years that he brought He used to drive a car. Okay. All right. But he, he was he was the epitome of the well-dressed man. I mean, he could sell ladies' clothes and first-class ladies' clothes. I guess you had sort of looked the part as a, as a ladies' clothing salesman. Well, he looked the part, believe me, he did. And I don't care what time of the day it was or what condition he was in, he was perfectly dressed at all times, wearing his hat, his tie button. He was never sloppy. He never, never, never anything other than just perfect impeccable. Uh, Ms. Pearl Hart worked in there also, my neighbor across the street. Worked in there for many years, but she married uh, Dr. Baker's, uh, uh, but they married Dr. Baker in a later date uh, after he lost his wife. Not this Dr. Baker, but this Dr. Baker's dad <laughs> is back here now. Uh, and she was a fine lady. She was a very strict Baptist, and, uh, and I, this is just a little gossip story, and it's not intended to be throwing any, any, anything to anybody, but she was in the backyard one day talking to my mother-in-law, Batty Crutzinger. And she says, Batty, she says, you know, the more I, I can study and the more I see, I think all the way to heaven is through the Baptist church. And my mother-in-law said, oh, Pearl, I'm sorry, I thought it was through Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but she really did believe in her church work now. She had two boys. Uh, you mentioned them last night when you talked on the phone. Biff or, or Henry was his name, and Leon. Leon and Biff. Henry. Henry was what we call Biff. 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 B-I-F-F. -F. Yeah, he was the he was the top boy. Leon married and had a family out in East Texas somewhere. And Henry or Biff went to work for an oilfield service company out of Fort Worth. And when I was living in Lafayette, he came to see me one day. He was in town to, for a day or two and uh, came to see Quay and I. And we renewed a full acquaintances. And I never saw him again. But I played golf with his boss, the man that owned that at Oilfield Service Company in Fort Worth. One time at an oil man's tournament in Fort Worth. And I asked him if he knew a boy named Henry Hart that worked for him. And Henry was young, little, little and not little, but small and dark complected. And he'd been working in the oil field. He got to his son dad. He said, oh, you talking about Black Hart? Oh, yeah, we got Black Hart working for us. We like it. <laughs> so Henry made a mark for himself in his work. But uh, uh, I don't really know where I am. What part of town am I in? Brown 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 Probably before your time. All right. Well, I didn't know that. It was before my time. I don't have any recollection of that at all. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, well, I know it was somebody in there because my daddy told me a story about that store without me knowing it, who, who had it. That they looked at their bill at the end of the year when they made a cotton crop to come in and settle up, and they had this circle in there. And he says, I ain't bought no grindstone. You got me charged with a grindstone. And they started talking about it, and it was a hoop of cheese that they sold. It. They, just, they just made a circle on the thing, and that's what they sold. It was a hoop of cheese instead of a grindstone. <laughs> I don't know who owned the store at the time, but it probably fit in with your, with your family back there. But I, I didn't know that. The, uh, of course, the Drake Building became a, a, a nice office building there. And, but I don't remember anything else other than that and uh, the AP and the AE days. Uh, a fly store being in there on that corner. And then you got into uh, Ms. Goodwill's, uh, Godwin's uh, fly, uh, clothing store. Ms. Ms. Godwin, uh, Albert Godwin's wife, had a, a, a clothing store in there. And uh, uh, John, John Benton, Johnny Benton's grandmother, were good friends of her. She spent a lot of time down there in that clothing store. When you went in there, you didn't know that Ms. Benton was part of the fi fixture there. 
she was always always in there visiting with this godly, and they were good friends and uh, so forth. And uh, I digress a little bit more on that. The historical association of some nature around here started talking about that old slave cabin back there on Pi on, uh, on, on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue that was built. Albert Godwin built that for him <laughs> and for Albert Godwin's son to play in. <laughs> it wasn't a slave cabin at all. <laughs> Yeah, John, John, John was there. He was help. He was there with his building. It was built for him and his and our Godless son. Uh, and uh, but uh, hmm. well, I guess I guess the next door was the, the walkway up to the Drake building and all the different offices up there. Phoenix Drake office up there. Claude Huckabee office up there. Uh, The lawyer office up there. Okay, what's the, what's the name of the office up there? Uh, no. Uh, Paul, Paul Kitchen's brother. Yeah. Great Kitchen yeah. office great up there. Kitchen. Yeah, Great Kitchen's office up there. A lot of them. Uh, the, uh, I got us back up to tell one story, and it may, I'm going to hold off to the very tail end and tell it to you. Uh, but uh, I'm going to come back to it. Uh, and after the, after the bank, the bank had a back entrance. If you go out the back door, in fact, if you were a kid and you went in there to buy, borrow money to buy a $25 or $50 car from J.E. Harper, you signed up at the papers in his window, there he turned, but when he turned and put his hands up like this and looked out the window, you knew that your time was over. Uh, he, he wasn't, he wasn't going to give you any more, you might want to get up and leave. Whatever you had done, you had finished. But he did like this and turned and looked out the window. You knew that it was all over with. Then you went out the back door of the bank and over across the street to Weston Miller's uh, insurance business and you bought the insurance on the car because that was part of the deal. <laughs> Your bank wasn't going to loan it to you if you didn't buy it from Weston Miller's insurance agency. And uh, so you, you did that. Uh, the, uh, the next door down there was actually, uh, uh, I'll have to think about this, but the old wood building, that's where Paul's drugstore was later on, so you know it, but David Brothers built that store there, built the building. But before then, it was somebody else's uh, store there. It was, uh, and I can't tell you who. My daddy would call the name like this, but they, a, they sold caskets upstairs in the store, whatever was there. It was an old wooden building, big, run down old wooden building. And uh, I don't know what all they sold in there. It was a drugstore of some nature. And, uh, but I can't give a name to it right now. But it had a side door, just like Boyle's did. It's still there, right up the old Pearl Street. I was about six years old, and my aunt had a Model A Ford coupe that had a rubble seat. Y'all remember rubble seats? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was in the rubble seat, and we parked Oak Pearl going this way, right by that side door. And my aunt, my mother was sitting in the front seat, and my aunt came running out and said, let's get out of here. They got trouble over to the courthouse. And that's when they had to kill it on the courthouse grounds. And I'm going to back up now and tell you that uh, Carl Fort uh, and the Fort family were very prominent in Bennett. Attorneys, Carl Fort had been mayor. I don't think he was mayor at the time. Uh, but he and Western Nation, who was on the board of Sturts uh, in Bennett, I think what called the board of Alderman. He was an alderman for the city. Got into an altercation on the step on the front of the old courthouse, which is right at the end of, the, of Pearl Street. And so Western Nation slapped Carl Fort. There's a big difference in their age. Uh, I don't know the difference, but old, older man, younger man slapping an old man. That's an old Webster nation. Huh? The father of the current Webster. Oh, the current Webster. Oh, the father of all 13 of those kids. Right. Yeah, old, old man Webster nation. Right. I mean, I, not, not the Webster nation right. that we know. So John Ford Hills about, and I guess he was at Fort Newstead. I don't know where he was. I don't even know that Fort Newstead was there then, but I guess it was. John went, Ford went running down there, took his knife and stabbed Webster nation and killed him. Uh, on, on, the, on the front of the courthouse. And, and again, I can't I mean, I do this kind of research. I don't know. I've heard he got some kind of penalty. He went to jail for a short while. He was put in the pea farm or something. He didn't, do, he didn't do much anyway. Whatever it was that wasn't long, he was back running his store up there. He served a year in Shreveport. He did what? One year. He, he went to a year in jail in Shreveport. All right, see, he knows more about better than I do. Uh, yeah, you do, but I, didn't I don't remember that. 
I don't know what happened to it. Uh, but anyway, Josh Walker became a good citizen of Benton. Uh, he had one daughter, Ellen Miles, who worked married A.J. Price, and lived in Spring Hill. Uh, when we were kids on Buckhanna Street, all of us playing down there, uh, Luther and me and uh, Cahill Drew and uh, Lloyd Baker and, and others, Ellen Miles would come. She lived up on Fort Street. She'd come down there and play with us, but we didn't want to play with her because we'd wrestle and cut up. And we couldn't beat her. She whooped us all. And we didn't want to play with Emmett Miles. She, she was stronger than we were. <laughs> and we went, we tried to avoid Emmett Miles. But uh, nevertheless, that took place. And I was sitting at that there about six years old in that rubble seat. I didn't see any part of it. I just know that's where I was. Uh, the, uh, but from, from the courthouse, then you got to another street, then the hitching rack, hitching yard. Where all the wagons came in on Saturday and hitched up their mules and everything down there, which is still a parking lot down there now, but uh, uh, for the uh, for, for, for the whatever's there in the city. What's, what's there right now? I guess the bank's there now. No, not the bank. It's a parking lot. There. It's just a parking lot there now. It's a parking lot, yeah. All right, that, that, that sort of takes you down to the park, and I'm going to stop and come down the other side of the street if I can without getting too confused. Uh, the other side of the street was the old, uh, I guess it was a national bank right there on that corner that had turned out not to be a bank anymore. I have a picture of my daddy standing at the counter in there in that bank. It was, I think it was a national bank, but it went out of business and, uh, and uh, they made a pool hall out of it. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and that's all I remember then after that. Then after that it became Vivian's uh, clothing store. And, uh, and they had offices upstairs where different attorneys lived and worked and they did their job. But in the back, going down Pearl Street, you had Dr. Bradford uh, in there, and his son had a jewelry store. Uh, Robert Bradford did jewelry work in there. And then they had the Railway Express down there. Uh, uh, it, it, was, it was a busy office in those days. You could send anything by Railway Express in those days. I Selby said, around that. Huh? Selby. Ran that, but Selby. It's what? Selby. Selby ran that. Oh yeah, Marvin Selby's daddy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. He did. I I I knew, but I couldn't call the name. Uh, so I'm gonna have to quit doing this. I mean, I'm just sitting up here worrying y'all to death, <laughs> but I can't remember what I'm talking You're about. You're doing good. You're doing good. You're fine. But uh, the uh, when we got to the park, we had that big swing down there. It had the big fountain. It had a great big huge fountain down there. And it had a big swing. And the swing was built about on telephone poles, two on the ground and one across the top. And when you really got in that swing and started pumping it, you didn't know that you could go so high you might fall out backwards in that thing. And, uh, but it was a real swing down in that park. And it did get used a lot. Uh, and they had the bandstand in there. And uh, the, the citizens of Benton, a lot of them uh, were musicians. And uh, they got together on a I guess it was a Friday or Saturday night and they would play music in the bandstand and people would go down there and just sit around and listen to the music and so forth. And it was uh, very famous, very popular. And, uh, the Menden Band played. Huh? Every, the Menden Band gave a concert one night a week oh, in I the summertime. Mean, in the summertime. Yeah, right. Mr. Dwight Blake. Dwight Blake and his wife, uh, Bobby. Bobby, Bobby Blake. I, I lived in Houston and subscribed to the Benton paper. And the Benton paper arrived at my mail, and they had a complete history of the Benton band, and nowhere in there did they mention either one of the Blakes. I wrote them a letter and by cancellation of the newspaper. You don't know any more about the history of Benton than this. I don't need to read it. And I gave up the paper. <laughs> uh, he was a fixture, believe me. Uh, my mother bought me a cornet. She thought I was going to be a musician. I, I was a mechanic. All I did was take it apart and work on it. And this Blake had to put it back together every time I came to practice. I, I couldn't ever play a tune on it or anything. But, uh, well, it was fun to watch Miss Molly drive. Yeah. She had a 39 Dodge, and whatever gear it was in when she cranked it up, that's the gear she had. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, have a lot of stories, funny stories like that. Uh, uh, Dr. R. E. Smith lived a little further down the street. I'm not going <coughs> much further down that side. Griff Park was filling station, the old Benton Hotel sitting back there. Uh, Ida Wiley's house and all that. I'm not going down in that section, but uh, Dr. R. E. Smith lived down there. Dr. R. E. Smith was my wife's <coughs> mother's cousin. Uh, half brother, really, half brother. And Joe. 
Miller lived across the street in the old Miller house, and there house as you know it. And the courthouse wasn't there. That courthouse wasn't there. It is just across the street. So there's the two old sitting there. Neither one of them belonged to a church. And Ms. Joe Miller came up to his truck singer's house, my mother-in-law, on Good Avenue, parked that fluid drive Dodge with the motor running against the curb. It could have taken off at any time. <laughs> you know, and uh, came in the house. Well, Manny, Manny, you won't believe it. Joe Miller and, and, and uh, R.A. Miller joined the, joined the church. I said, no, I don't believe it. Uh, but what they did, they both joined the church. They said, too late to gamble on it anymore. <laughs> uh, but uh, funny stories about it. But uh, the, uh, the I digress from from uh, the ice cream newsstand up there with John Ford to tell about the stabbing night at the courthouse. They put it in up there. But that uh, going on down this street, then we got in down there to uh, uh, Lloyd David's uh, general merchandise store. And it had a stairway going up into a balcony. It had a stairway going out to a semi-basement, wide stairway. And they, they sold merchandise of that nature in there. And, uh, and that was Bert David. I don't know if y'all remember Bert David. My age, I went to high school with him. It was his daddy. And uh, then the next building was the Crane Hardware building. And uh, John, uh, Tom Crane owned that, and ran that building. He ran the hardware store. And uh, the... Uh, Next building was Flew Evans. Bert Flew Evans was uh, lived in the house where Miss Monk lives up by the, by the uh, yeah. Academy Park. And uh, but that's uh, who owned that store. And it was Flew Evans, and it was a good men's store. And uh, he put uh, a pair of shoes in the window, and uh, he uh, put you know twelve dollars, eight dollars, whatever they were. Jack Bridges was selling the same store, same shoe up there, two dollars less. In those days, they wanted to trade. He could holly. Bert was out in front of his store. Jack Reeves was up the other end of the street. How the devil can you sell shoes down there two dollars more than I am? Well, Pierce, all Jack is that's the difference in merchandising and shoe selling. <laughs> <laughs> he put a light on his shoes at night in that window <laughs> so people could see them at night. Uh, and, uh, the next thing now was Leroy Rathbun's general store. He sold cloth and material to make clothes out of and threads. Oh, I forgot, I forgot, Mr. Uh, uh, Marcus had the, uh, uh, the, the spoon, the red, spoon. The red, the red mercantile. Huh? Red mercantile. Red mercantile. Red mercantile. Uh, Mr. Red had a little store up there next to the, to the bank on, on, and sold spools of thread and so forth. Lots of other material they Abraham sold. Abraham Dow had a big store back there. Who did? Abraham Dow. Well, on that side of the street. Oh, yeah, that was on the back street. Right. But I could I about to forget about Mr. Red's spool store in there. Mostly he sold thread, but he sold a lot of other stuff too. Well, his wife sold number and you know, uh, clothing and materials, you know, so patterns and stuff like that. All that stuff was very famous back in those days. A lot of people sold it, a lot of people used it. Yeah, and, uh, but Leroy Rappin had a general store. And then the next one on the corner was W.R. Bigby's store. And he just, I don't know what W.R. Bigby sold. I, I, I've been in his store many times with my daddy, but we just stood up front and talked. But I don't know what he sold. But anyway, W.R. Bigby had a bad experience. He adopted a son. They lived in a house across the street from me where uh, Dad would just live right now. And they loved that house. Miss Bigby had one brown eye and one, one yellow, one uh, brown eye, one blue eye and one brown eye. And, uh, but, uh, and my mother-in-law had a little dog named Scrappy. And anytime she saw Miss Bigby coming across the street, she went after her purse. Scrappy got over and killed the chicken. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, the Bigby's had a adopted boy named W.R. Bigby, and they gave him the house when he married. And he wasn't married long, and they didn't want to give up the house. They moved out on McDonald Street behind the present Methodist Church into a house down there, just a place to live. But he wasn't married long, and I don't know why I'm talking about three months or two years, but it was a short period of time that he sold the house. And it just devastated them that they didn't get to keep it. He moved out on Highway 80, past uh, Fillmore out there, and built a house on the right, and spent his career working at the Shell plant. But the biggest didn't, didn't approve of that. Nobody in town approved of it. I mean, they, they, they loved that house, and they gave it to that son, and he sold it immediately. Uh, the, uh, now, Leroy Rathbun went out of business. Now, Leroy Rathbun lived three houses down from me, 
and he was married to Ada Rathwood. And Ada Rathwood was a Phillips, and by daddy's first wife's sister. It was Ada and Kate and uh, Eva across the street, Eva Burrell. And uh, so I'd go down that evening, my daddy'd go down there and visit with him. And Leroy had an old push lawn boy that he kept sharp. He could just make it sing when he pulled that little front yard. He always had a chew in the back of his mouth. And he sung in the Methodist Church choir for 40 years, I guess. And he could sing with that chew in the back of his mouth. Oh, my and he, on Christmas morning, he would play, they said he played a trumpet, it was a cornet. He played God Save the King or something, I don't know what he played. He played, played something on Christmas morning, uh, some song. But it was, you could hear it all over town when he got on his front porch playing it. But Leroy had to go out of business. He's broke. Uh, he, he, boy, my daddy came home and he said, I'm down there at Leroy's. I said, he's just beside himself. They don't know what they're going to do. He don't have a job. He don't have any money. And nobody going to hire anybody his age and so forth. The next night he came down there and he said, well, I'll tell you what. The Lord takes care of good people. Tom Crate hired him to run that hardware store and open it up every morning at 6 o'clock. He could go home at 2 o'clock. And he got up at 4 or 5 o'clock anyway. And he got up and walked out of there and opened up Creighton Hardware at 6 o'clock every morning. It was the most dedicated, honest employee anybody ever had in there at that hardware store. And he, he, he walked home in the afternoon. His wife could drive. Ava could drive. They had an old Chevrolet that had solid wheels on it. So what age was that, Shelly? Solid wheels? Solid wheels. Probably about a 19, well, before Model T, so. Yeah, it, it had solid. 1918. Well, it, it had solid wheels, and, uh, but she would drive it, but he, he never rode in it. He walked to work and he walked home. And, uh, but uh, anyway, Tom Craig gave him a job, and he stayed there and he died, and then it made a fine employee for Tom Craig down there at a hardware store. Uh, so that just about takes care of Front Street. I'm not getting there to the cross down there to the other houses and moving on down to Bracket Motor and all that. No, it's not too interesting. That, uh, uh, they just most of the big houses in there got torn down and moved and so forth. The old Bennett Hotel was a fixture. It was faced Pearl Street, but it faced Bay Street, but it was way back behind Grand Portman's filling station there at, uh, before the filling station was built. And uh, Dr. Banks lived there when he first moved to Bennett, before he moved into the house up there next to me. And we went down to supper down there one night and parked old Pearl and walked into that hallway and ate supper in the old Bennett Hotel. The only time I was ever in it down there. But it was a fixture in town for a long time. And uh, I know I've forgotten a lot of things. And like I say, I wasn't a Main Street boy. I was a Back Street boy. <laughs> uh, anybody wants to fill me in, go ahead. Uh, I thank Marcus and, and Joe for helping me out, and sure. But, uh, you know, I can sit down and work some of this out after a period of time. You know, uh, it just takes a while to come up with it. But, uh, I appreciate very much y'all inviting me, and I thank you for coming. I've got just one other thing to tell you before I sit down. Okay, you don't uh, have to sit down. All right, that, Keep on going. Uh, there you go. In 1901, the guy named uh, uh, Marty O'Field drove a Ford car 60 miles an hour over Oak Track without incident. Fastest car had ever been driven. Uh, it's on display at Hershey Museum, in Hershey, Pennsylvania, the Ford Museum today. The number is 999. It doesn't compare with what happened to me when my friend Johnny Benton invited me to go to Italy with him about three weeks ago <laughs> and uh, spent two weeks over there while he showed me Italy. And let me tell you, that little incident that Marty Oldfield did has nothing to do with Johnny Benton driving the same <laughs> day five miles an hour, too late there. It was in Italy. And there was an incident. I never put the brakes on one time sitting on the passenger side. <laughs> he did a great job. And we had a marvelous trip, and it was a very pleasant trip. And I thank you, Johnny, for inviting me. And let me tell you, that boy knows something about Italy. And when he, he did it everything. I didn't have to do anything but show up. And it was just a great experience, and uh, I couldn't take it. We went to Florence and to Rome and to Venice and then to all the smaller towns around there. And I won't let him tell the story about who we met over there. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. We were, we, uh, we've been over there for the better part. Of we, we've been on the train to Florence and on the train to Rome and doing this, that, and the other. I about wore Frank out, and I told him, I said, it was Saturday. And I said, we're going to have a free day today. And I said, we're going to go to a hill town by uh, name, it's called Orvieto. 
it will be about 30 minutes south of where we are. And so I said, we'll just get up in the morning and go, and I said, no good place to eat lunch down there. We'll just go whenever we get up. So we messed around that Saturday morning, washing clothes and stuff like that. Didn't get away. Didn't get to Orvieto until about 2.15 or 2.30. And we got right to the restaurant right quick, and he was full. And so he told us, he said, come back in about 15 or 20 minutes. And he said, a lot of these people will be gone, and that way we can sit and visit. He was a friend of mine. And I said, okay, so I told Frank, I said, we'll walk up this street, it's all, no cars or anything, but it's just shops and restaurants on both sides of the street. And I told Frank, I said, we'll walk up this street to the cathedral up here at the top of the top end of the street, I'll show it to you and all that, and we'll do that before lunch instead of after. So we were walking up the street, and, and we, we went around a lot, little curve, and we could see the cathedral, and I was explaining to him about the cathedral and all that. We're walking along, somebody says, hey, Johnny Benton. <laughs> <laughs> I turned around, and it was Jack Burr. <laughs> Jack Burr. So Jack, Jack and Peggy Burr were on a bus tour. They had come through there and stopped for two or three hours. <laughs> and, 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 and it's like you go halfway around the world, and you're walking down the street, and nobody speaks English, and somebody says, hey, Johnny Benton. <laughs> This is an old town. I think those cobblestones were laid down there by the Romans that we were yeah. walking on. That's certainly coincidental because we just decided to go that day and, and, it, and, and we got there and the restaurant was full so we didn't, or we'd have been eating. We, we would have never have seen it. So. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this off with the same thing that I did the first night. It was during a political race, a uh, national political race, that I said, a lot of people can say a lot of things and never, never say a word. They can do a lot of talking and it doesn't mean anything. But uh, one of the things that took place in the Old Star Drug Building upstairs where Dr. Martin office and Dr. R.A. Smith office, in the back corner back there, there was a fellow here named Grigsby. And we called him Judge Drick Grigsby. Older fellow, had been an attorney at one time. That's all I know. But he and uh, Tommy Suggs and uh, uh, McCrary boy, uh, what was his name? Craig Leonard McCrary and others would gather up there in the afternoons and they had beer in an ice tub and they'd drink beer and tell stories. Okay, so old Judge Grigsby wrote this article up and I don't know where he got all this from but he made it up and it was about two pages long and I did have the whole article but I memorized the first paragraph of it. And I'm going to close with saying this, that you can talk a lot and never say anything. It says, gather around me brother and sister for today I'm going to preach through the sermon on the on the root of evil, that of the apple. Was it not on one Friday morning that Sir Humphrey Gravy Newton lay snoozing under that red apple tree when one of those large-sized pippins fell off and hit him right square dab in the right eye? Right then and there, he arose, exclaimed, and proclaimed that patent lever principle by which all of the luminous and voluminous planets circumnavigate around the sun in one grand equal machine. <laughs> <laughs>